They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 826, Tuesday, April 26th. This is the TDN Writers Room, as you can see, on scene at Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I've been having so much fun in Lexington and in Keeneland this weekend, guys. I might just take a little accent home from me to Brooklyn. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And yes, it is nearing the first Saturday in May, and we are sitting here in parkas in frigid Lexington, Kentucky. Joe, what happened to the 80 degree weather? I don't know. I, I got to go back home to Brooklyn. I'm taking this weather with me, unfortunately. There you go. But now, everybody thinks it's a quiet weekend in racing because, you know, the Derby's coming up the following Saturday. You got it all wrong. At Fauner Park this Saturday, it's their biggest day of the meet. The feature race is the $75,000 Bosselman Pump and Pantry Gus something or other stakes. I know I'm psyched, John. Wait, who was that sponsor? Who was the sponsor um, of the race? Pump and Pantry. It's it's a um I think it's like their version of 7-Eleven or something. Okay, okay. Yeah. But it wasn't the big ass fan. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, all right. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I have to say that I'm so happy to be here at Keeneland. So many great memories, not only you know winning big races, but also being here for the sales, buying and selling. And uh, guys, this is this is April in Kentucky, you know, where you get 80 degrees, 40 degrees. Yeah. That's the way it is. But um, that's why we love Kentucky and that's why we love being here. That's why you gotta live it up on the days that are nice. Definitely did. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. This Friday is the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale. It's also closing day at Keeneland. The sale takes place after the races. And also this Friday is the deadline to get your entries in for the Keeneland September sale. And here to talk to us about all that is the VP of Sales, Tony Lacey. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a real pleasure. Great to have you. You're smart enough to wear gloves, which <laughs> I love that. So shout out to you. You're already ahead of us. Um, but so let's talk a little bit about the, the sale on Friday. It's a little bit of a mix of digital and on location sales. Can you can you talk about what the feedback has been for those hybrid sales and, and you kind of where you're looking to go with it? Well, when you say hybrid, I'd be very honest, the vast majority of the horses are going to be here, you know, and that's what we wanted to try and lean into, make sure, if at all possible, that we could get these horses on site, which will lend to the atmosphere. It'll lend into the environment that we're trying to create and build as we go forward with this sale. Uh, it's a segment of the market that has been really vibrant. There's real growth in it, you know. And again, with the with the the sort of the the flourishing of these of of uh, syndicates and partnerships, it's important that we allow and find ways of uh, getting people into the game and having a turnkey horse that they can come, they can they can inspect, give them all the information that they need, so they can make educated and informed decisions uh, that they could run a horse within a week or two. Uh, Tony, good morning, and thanks for joining us. Uh, you talked about the hybrid nature of the sale with it being both remote and on-site. The other change is that it's occurring after the races. And, you know, really, to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's unprecedented for a major sale. What is the, the reasoning behind that? Well, I think, you know, as we came, like I've started almost a year ago, you know, the first thing we did was look at everything and how do we better service our clients? What's the, what is the best way we do things? So is Keeneland and embodies everything that in the in the industry. It's it's a sales company, but it's also a world class racetrack. So by combining the two activities on the one day, logistically for a team, it's really challenging. But it was they everybody knew it was very important that we could pull it off to get it done. And the feedback has been really really positive. I think the uh, people really appreciate the fact that they can go racing, you know, watch the Bewitched, have a couple of allowance races right afterwards and walk down the hill and an hour later we're able to sell, sell horses so it's it's combining the two activities it allows us to be able to complete that sale before people start my sort of moving over to churchill for derby week um, and i think that's really what we don't want to confuse anything and we want to build on what we've got here and, and lean into it as much as possible and Tony, one of the things that Keeneland has implemented over the past couple of years has been the online platform sure. as far as being able to bid, you know, through the Internet. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're all in New Jersey, so obviously it, it, it's great for us to be able to buy and sell, um, you know, with you guys, but also be able to bid, um, you know, online. How has that expanded the sales opportunities for you guys? Well, I think like a lot of things, I think the, the pandemic has forced a lot of innovation that may have taken a lot longer to initiate. And I think it was something that... It, the horse industry is not something that really embraces change really quickly. 
So as we, the, <laughs> so as we, as we learn from a lot, a lot of our customers have really appreciated the fact of being able to bid online and, and, but being able to do their homework, information, transparency is incredibly important. And the fact that we're trying to be flexible as much as possible, trying to find ways to make it convenient because tradi a traditional auction is absolutely the, you know, something that's not going to go away, but we've got to find a way of moder modernizing it and finding a way to, that better suits the moder modern, uh, modern way of doing business. Yeah, and I think the future is these, these combined sales horses of racing age. You know, sometimes there's two-year-olds horses of racing age. Do you think that that's the do you think that's the future of sales? Do you think that you know aside from the Keeneland September's and the sure. Keeneland November's, do you think that that's going to be more of the future is to have totally different offerings in one sale? Well, I think it's it's certainly that in November, for example, we have breeding stock and right. horses of racing age. We moved that to the end of the sale because of two different entities. Yep. Um, so we different market market markets completely. So I think there traditionally we did have a two year old sale on site, yep. but. Really, it, it, was, it became apparent that the consigners in Florida, they had focus on sales and OBS. And so it was, not, it was not something that they could really manage. Uh, yeah. And we, we appreciate that. We listened. And so as we look at the way, we look at the fact that there's racehorses, some of the best racehorses in the country are on our backstretch during April. Uh, the best jockey's population. You know, we've got a great co concentration of trainers. So let's... let's Let's play into that, yeah. and that's what we want to try and and again combine everything what's best of what we do. Uh, we're not trying to be something we're not, and we want to we want to be as responsive as possible. So, and I think there's there's always ways of improving and and, and evolving yep. as we go into the future. Tony, I know you're a sales guy and not necessarily a racing guy, but I'll, I'll pose this question to you, and I'm sure you'd be glad to answer it. Um, Keeneland, as we speak, uh, with what three days left in the meet, is on track to likely set a new record for highest spring handle uh, in its history. Um, this is in a, during a, a year where the general handle in racing is pretty much flat for the year. What's going on? What, what is happening here that, you know, you already had, you always had good business, but it's seemingly it's gone to another level. Well, actually, we blew by it on Friday. You did? Okay, on on you Sunday, I okay. should say. Sorry. Congratulations. Uh, That's yeah, great. Yeah, all time. Yeah. So we blew by the all time spring. Uh, handle a few days ago, and we did a, an all-time record on Sunday. So we still got three days to go. Incredible! I think the field sizes have been very important. Gatewood has done, and, and the racing team have done an incredible job putting a very strong um, cattle or condition book together. Attracted a lot of the best horses. Great prize money, which lends into again when we have a good September, when we have a good sale year. This what's this is the this is the fruits of the labor because we're able to increase the purses we're able to make a stronger product, the the betters really really enjoyed we're watching the numbers come in, and it's it, we broke two or three records during the if not more during the race meet uh, for an all time one day record all time Wednesday all time Thursday, so I think we've we, we again a little bit like our September sales and our November sales last year. We don't want to take anything for granted. We got to learn what what worked. I think we're in a very we're in a little bit of a an exciting era when it comes to Kentucky racing. It's a very strong circuit. The purses are going to be incredibly strong as we move forward. When you see the jockey population and the trainers that were here during the meet, I think that only lends to the and the demand for stalls has been, never been stronger. So we've got to find a way of okay, we got to grow on this. And uh, I think it's really exciting and I think it's, it's good for the sport. I know in other, other areas, but again, I think as, as, a, as an industry leader, we've got to try and find ways of how we help the industry in a, as a whole. And this is a good way as we learn. And I commend you guys for not only breaking the records, but also having the, um, the, the proper foresight not to let Joe in on Saturday. That was, that was actually really smart on your part. You didn't part. call me. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's stick with racing. Um, so this year, uh, at the end of the year, you're going to have the, the crown jewel, the Breeders' Cup here. What are you guys planning um, that's going to be different as far as hosting the Breeders' Cup this year? Well, I think anybody who was here in 2015 understood that was probably one of the, the, the best couple of days racing, the atmosphere. What's unique about Keeneland, I think that you find, and I've heard it from so many people, everybody that's here are professionals. You know, they, under, they really understand the industry. Yeah. They're a, they've got a passion. They, 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 uh, there's a true love amongst, the, amongst everybody in the grandstand. There's going to be 45,000 people here. Um, so that's an incredible event in itself. 
And uh, I think as you see, in, and can, you know, when we've got, as we've got the Breeders' Cup um, happening just up on the other side of this little laneway, we've got the November sale and some of those fillies and mares coming right through here, which again embraces everything we do. And again, everything we, they, as the, the stronger we are in November, the stronger the, the April meet will be. And so that, that again is, it just energizes the industry, I think, as we uh, try to make it, make it better for everybody. Well, Tony, congratulations on all the records that are being broken this meet. Best of luck with the sale on Friday, and we appreciate you stopping by the set. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Good stuff. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Like I said, this Friday is that April Horses of Racing Age sale, also the deadline for the Keeneland September yearling sale. Check all that out at Keeneland.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. With all eyes on the bluegrass this spring, there's no better way to take in the action than Friday, April 29th at Keeneland. And they're off. We get into it with hip number one. Good luck. Featuring a day filled with world-class racing, followed by a unique sales experience in the evening. The April Horses of Racing Age sale. After the races on closing day of the spring. <laughs> Follow the action this April to Keeneland. Spites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town raced away. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Jerkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. We told you it would happen. I was out at Ashford on Monday and I got to see my favorite stallion in the world, Cupid. So you got plenty of footage. Also got to see American Pharaoh, Justify. Ashford is obviously a stunning place to visit. And uh, we appreciate Robin over there for showing us around. So check out me and Cupid hitting it off. <laughs> so I'm here at beautiful Ashford Stud here in the heart of bluegrass country in Kentucky. and. Now I'm about to meet my boo, my boy. He doesn't know he's my boo or my boy, but if you watch the show, you know I'm particularly obsessed with this stallion. So let's bring out my son, Cupid. Pretty boy. Oh, he's just as handsome as I had predicted. Even more beautiful in person. So next up in the rotating guest chair here at Keeneland is Chance Tim of Grovendale Sales. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great to have you. Great to talk to you. Um, so you you have an extensive background in the business. Lane's End, Don Alberto. Now you're working for with James Keogh for Grovendale Sales. Can you talk a little bit about how this opportunity might differ from some of the stuff you'd previously done in the industry and kind of how that knowledge base might help you? Yeah, you know, it's something that James and I have been talking about doing for a long time, actually. James and I have been close friends. We've partnered on horses for a long time. He's, he's been really good to me since I first came out here uh, prior to Flying Start in like 07, I guess it was. So uh, luckily enough, I've been able to call him my friend, and now I get to call him my partner. But, um, you know, my time at Lane's End, I uh, was the director of Stallion Seasons and Chairs over there for eight years, but was pretty heavily involved with the sales consignment over there, recruiting and placing the horses. So luckily enough, working with Alaire and, and Mike Klein and Bill and David and all the great team over there, I was able to learn quite a lot and, and hopefully put me in a position to take this next step uh, here on my own. Uh, Chance, thanks for joining us. Well, the next step continues on Friday with the Horses of Racing Age Sale. Uh, for the new partnership, it'll be your first time selling horses. Just give us an overview a little bit about your thoughts on the sale, maybe some of the changes they brought in, and also some of the horses you guys will be selling. Yeah, I think it's a great spot. I mean, I think, you know, we're in the business of selling horses, so any you know, opportunity there is to sell horses, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, Tony kind of referenced it earlier, uh, you know, just having that frequency. And I think, you know, nowadays, especially like in the information age, like, you know, people want that transparency and they, they want to be able to see, you know, what's out there. And prospective buyers want to know about the process and the horses and, and be able to participate anywhere in the world. So I think it's great. Um, I think the horse of racing age segment is a really good fit for Keeneland here, this, especially this time of year. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense, obviously, for the, you know, leading into the summer seasons. And for us, we've got a handful of maidens. We've got four horses in the catalog. Uh, they're all maidens, you know, so they have a lot of racing in front of them. Um, and we're looking forward to representing the owners. And, and Chance, one of the things that, that you specialized in at Lane's End was, you know, the stallion seasons and shares. Now that you're independent, 
Um, are there some under the radar stallions that, that you have gravitated towards or that you're recommending to clients to breed to? You know, I, 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 funny enough, in the Keeneland sale, they announced that they've got a share in Upstart uh, to be to be offered for purchase, which I think is really interesting. Uh, he, he's a horse that I, I actually tried to buy a share in a few months ago, but uh, came up a little short. But uh, it's only more expensive now. Yeah, right, yeah. That's the way it goes. But, uh, but yeah, I think that horse is doing a lot of great things and obviously has a big chance, you know, on, on Friday and Saturday at Derby Week to, to make some, a whole lot of noise, you know. But I think he's really interesting. He's got a lot of very nice, solid, great stakes horses. You know, from a moderate stud fee and, and pretty moderate mares, you know. So I think he's, uh, I think he's a horse to pay attention to for sure. And if you ever want to come back to the show, you have to say Cupid. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have to. Huh? <laughs> My buddy. Um, so I mean, the the trend. I was talking to Tony about this. The trend in sales to be a little bit more digital, a little bit more offsite since uh, COVID started. Um, how, how do you feel the appetite is for for those kind of sales compared to the onsite sales? Do you think clients still mostly want to be onsite, or they're getting more comfortable with the the online version of the sales? I think it's a bit of both. You know, I, I think for the most part. You you know, if you're going to spend a significant amount of money, like upwards into six figures, you know, I think most people want to have somebody on site to see the horse and obviously physically inspect them. The greater investment you're going to have, obviously, you want to, you know, do every aspect of your due diligence that you should. But, you know, for the lower to, you know, middle range horses, I think it's been revolutionary. Yes. You know, like, yeah. I mean, last September we were back here and we were selling horses with no reserve for 50, 70 grand. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. You know, the horses just walking up there and the internet was all over the place, you know? So, when you give them all that information online, videos, veterinary work, you know, all that kind of stuff where they can have confidence, uh, I think it correlates to bids. Yep. Right. Uh, Chance, we're here in the center of the universe of horse racing in Kentucky. You come from, from a horse racing perspective, perhaps the exact opposite. Yeah. How the heck does a guy from Utah be now sitting here involved as a major player in, 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 in the thoroughbred horse racing business right here again in, in the heart of the business in, um, in, in Kentucky. I mean, Utah, there will never be a racetrack in Utah, ever. <laughs> well, uh, th there's a couple racetracks. <laughs> no gambling, no, though, right? not near as notable as yeah. this place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there is a dirt surface and horses running around in right. a circle. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I'm just lucky, Bill, to be honest. Like, I've been, I've been really fortunate to have a couple really good breaks. The Race for Education gave me a scholarship out of high school. Uh, Elizabeth Jensen and Bill Kasner speared that up for a long time. I uh, was fortunate to get on the flying start and, um, you know, some really good friends and good contacts. You know, um, you know, Jerry Duffy has been a really close friend of mine that's put me in a really good spot on numerous, you know, numerous occasions. And my father-in-law, Bobby Spaulding, um, have been, you know, really close, you know, dear friends and contacts that have, you know, helped me uh, get to this point. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky for sure. And, and Chance, you guys, you know, handle so many different aspects of the industry with the, the breeding side and the selling. And obviously you're trying to recruit um, fillies off the racetrack. What is your favorite day on the calendar? Is it Kentucky Derby Day? Is it the first day of the September sale? Is it, you know, is it, it can't be anniversaries or birthdays. What's your favorite <laughs> racing day of the of the year? Well, if, if, it's, if it's racing day, uh, I really enjoy Saratoga. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite times of the year that... You know, to be honest, you know, what we do and, and every consigner and, and salesperson will attest to it and buyer, um, it's hard. You know, it, it's a lot of work. You know, when you work a sale on any side of it, it's a lot of work. Saratoga is a riot. Like, I mean, it's so much fun and the numbers are manageable. You're there for a prolonged period of time. You get experience, you know, the best stock, you know, on the racetrack as well as in the sales ring. So I, I really treasure that time. I, I really enjoy going up there every year. Um, you know, but it's it, from the sales aspect, I love day of sale day. Like one of the things I enjoy the most is, you know, bright and early mornings on sale day, trying to figure out who's on the horse, how much they're going to bring, you know, all the intricate details that go into, you know, getting that horse sold. And it's a real buzz. I gotta say, as a Saratoga evangelist, this is the closest I've ever gotten to Saratoga. Yeah, yeah. This is my first time here, and it's, it's been amazing. Um, can, you, can you remember your first time and how it felt to be here? Yeah, funny enough, when I was going to school in the University of Arizona, um, I, they, uh, United Tote needed some, some help with some students to train uh, some new tellers on the new tote system, so they recruited us from U of A in the racetrack industry program. 
and we came out here and we actually went to Belmont as well training the the tellers so we got paid to come and go to the races which I wow, thought was amazing wow. yeah, yeah. That. yeah but I remember coming here and walking around to the training track and walking up and like I was just you know like Bill referenced I'd never seen anything like yeah. this yeah. place you know yeah. so that's a little different than the bush tracks in Utah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Chance, we really appreciate you stopping by. I know it's a busy week for you, and best of luck with the sale. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah, great job. You. Great stuff. Okay. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Lane's End. This week's Lane's End Stallion of the Week is City of Light. Yearlings by City of Light were on fire at the sales last year, and they've continued to blow up at the two-year-old sales. We cannot wait to see his horses on the track. I think there's such high anticipation and excitement for for his first crop. He stands for sixty thousand dollars. So if you can get in, get in now because that price might go up. We'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. City of Light. A multiple grade one winner with 5.6 million in earnings. Winner of the grade one Malibu, the grade one triple bend, the grade one Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, posting a 110 buyer, and the grade one Pegasus World Cup, posting a 112 buyer. The best son to date of leading stallion quality road. City of Light stands to continue his sire's legacy at Lane's End. With some of the fullest fields in the country, and quality racing year round. There's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brats, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. This year, Kentucky Breds won every single 100-point race on the Kentucky Derby Trail, so that field's going to be loaded with Kentucky Breds. But let's talk about the even more important Kentucky Breds, the foals that I went to see on the farm yesterday. It was great to see all the babies, and it really really added to the experience of coming down here to horse country. So those Kentucky Breds, you know, they're, they're, they're a money machine. You see those $100,000 purses over here at Keeneland? It's going to be even better at Churchill, so check them out. So let's talk a little bit of racing. It was a beautiful, beautiful weekend at Keeneland. There was a ton of great racing, big fields, like Tony was talking about. It's really probably the, the best betting product until Saratoga, I would yeah. say. Um, there's nothing else that, that really compares. Um, but outside of Keeneland, there were a couple of big performances. Obviously, the headliner for the weekend was Latruska in the Apple Blossom, successfully defending her title, holding off Clary Eric, who I think is going to have a pretty big year. Uh, would, I mean, it's, it's, at this point, what is, else is there to say about Latruska? You know, as long as they don't do anything outside the box, like run against males or something like that, there really isn't. I mean, she's, other than the, the Breeders' Cup distaff, which uh, was the pace meltdown and she had a perfect excuse, she's just a machine, Joe. Yeah. I mean, she just goes out there and does her job. And it was an interesting race. There are only five horses in the race, but what a good field it was. Yeah. You had another champion in CC. You had, uh, uh, of the five horses, four were grade one winners in there. So she really, you know, got the job done. Um, it looks now that, so she beat one champion in CC. It looks like now she's going to face another champion in Malathat, who ran the day before here at Keeneland. Uh, I don't know if we're going to talk more about that race yeah, or not, sure. but in the June 10th Og Ogden Phipps at Belmont. So, you know, there's no uh, easy path for her right now because that division, as it has been for the last couple of years, is pretty loaded. So, uh, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting too that, you know, she was a horse of the year candidate last year uh, and to a point where she didn't come through in the Breeders' Cup. Now, she's going to, there's so many good male horses out there, she's going to need to have a situation where nobody really flourishes to be able to uh, to become horse of the year. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, now, Malathat, on the other hand, she's an interesting horse. She's uh, also a wind machine, but she never impresses right, you. Right. She just goes out there and, you know, at the, at the uh, 3 16 ball, she's kind of right there and she grinds away. And the next thing you know, she's a half length in front. But take nothing away from her. All she does is win. But, you know, she's, she's the... the the best horse I can remember in a long time that every time she runs, she's just like, oh, okay, yep. you know. Right. Right. And, and just going back to Latruska, you know, you mentioned that, that she was in a race, five horse field, four of them were grade one winners, um, but she had to run a lifetime best buyer number to win. She, mm -hmm. she tied up uh, her lifetime best with a 103 buyer. Um, in this race, and uh, and you know, in, in in a race that was jam packed with with really top horses, and my other takeaway is the fact that 
you know, she's six years old. They didn't have to run her this year. They could have cashed in. They could have bred her to, you know, the top stallions in, in the world if they wanted to. Um, but instead, they brought her back. And as a six-year-old, as a six-year-old, she's, you know, hitting lifetime best numbers um, and looks like she's, you know, going to continue to improve. So for me, it was, it was the weekend was all about Latruska. Um, and the fact that she just keeps on winning and keeps on beating, um, as, as you said, a very deep field of fillies and mares. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally with Bill, by the way, on, on Malathot. She's like the, the winningest horse I've never been impressed right. by. Yeah. You know, it's just it's, it's one of those things where she's just a grinder. And it, I feel like often she doesn't, she doesn't look like she's going to win. That's, that, I would say that's the most impressive thing. Sometimes you see her getting scrubbed down on the turn, and you think, well, today's the day that, that she gets taken down, and she does find a way to win. But a couple other interesting horses I wanted to mention from Saturday at Keeneland, because there were some other stakes. Um, the Elkhorn Channel Maker, who I was completely against. I was, like, against Channel Maker at, like, 8 to 5 or 9 to 5, and then he wins at 7 to 2, and I'm like, <laughs> should have just used him. Um, but it was nice to see that because he had gone off form a little bit. And you t- we want to talk about a war horse, a horse that shows up year after year after year, and he's big marathon turf races so i thought i thought it was good to to see him get back on forum and the other horse was who i think might be all right is is uh scalding in the yeah. ben alley the yeah. uh the, the suge horse he's a horse that i was i again i was against on saturday <laughs> um you can tell how my day went um and he, i was against him at tampa but he just keeps getting better he's a lightly raced horse and i think you know maybe on the lower levels of the handicap division he can make some noise and the thing about a suge horse is you expect him to keep getting yeah. better you don't think that they're going to top out and then fall off and, you know, similarly to Latruska, I think that's what's so impressive about her is especially the Phillies and Mares. I feel like it's sometimes it's hard for them to keep their form year after year after year. So the fact that she's still out here in top form as a six-year-old it speaks to the training job that Fausto Gutierrez does. And it speaks to the mayor and, and her desire to race, I think. I, I want to uh, uh, jump in on what John said about bringing her back as a six-year-old. And it's great, but it's not that unique right now. The 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 trend in racing is, okay, so the, the male horses are going to be tired as soon as possible. Uh, we all know that. But the, the the trend now is people are keeping these fillies and mares in training. They are running at five. They are running at six. I mean, we don't see them, uh, you know, whisked off into the breeding shed after three, not necessarily even after four. And, you know, to me that, uh, you know, horses like Latruska, and then you go back, of course, to Zenyatta and Rachel and, and plenty others in between. You know, they're becoming, to me, these horses, they're the stars of the game because they're going to not race seven times. You know, they run, they're going to run, you know, three, four, five, uh, maybe six. Uh, you know, who, who knows? Remember, I mean, the owner uh, is one of the wealthiest men in the world. Maybe he just says, I couldn't care less if I, if I you know, uh, about whatever I can get from breeding her. Maybe the runner next year. Who knows? Uh, but it, it's a nice trend. And, uh, you know, other thing, too, is, and I've written about this before, um, all the horses that are getting into the Hall of Fame now are all fillies. Because nobody, okay, a horse ran seven times. I'm putting that horse in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, you have to go back to uh, American Pharaoh, I think is the last male horse. And obviously he gets in because of, uh, you know, winning the Triple Crown. But, but you know, it's, it's an interesting trend in racing. So go, go, go girls. Right, That's right, right. Yeah. No, exactly. And the other, the other takeaway from the weekend is baby races are starting. Mm-hmm. There were a couple of baby races, uh, you know, here at Keeneland, and and that just brings a whole new crop of, uh, of potential horses in. And and you know, everyone is. Uh, what's the old saying? You, you never, you never. Uh, uh, no, I can't say that saying. Sorry. <laughs> well, now I want to know what it was. Yeah. That's, all, that's an off the air saying. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but, anyway, but 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 spring is on, upon us. There's babies and uh, that, that are running, and they're all undefeated. I've got an interest on in the baby race. John, did you notice that? Uh, so today is Tuesday. There, both yesterday and today, there uh, parks had two-year-old races at two furlongs, and yeah. the, there's a horse in the race today. I don't know the name of the horse that ran in the four and a half furlong came. So he's turning back from four and a half wow. furlongs. Right. Wow. So you have to wonder, can, how can he handle? How, I think it's a filly. Right. How can she handle the turnback right. from four right. and a half to two? But more so. importantly, to, to your your point um, from last show, she's running two weeks later. Yes, yeah, so exactly, there's, there's, yes. there's a horse that's running yes. every two weeks. Yeah, right, you don't know? have anybody ready for the two furlong races, John. I, I probably, you know, I probably do, but yeah. uh, but you know, we want to we want to make sure that we're showcasing them. Right. But yeah. Otherwise, because I don't think that the winner of the two furlong race is going to be a rising star. I just have that uh, anticipation. So that's that's why we're not so running. Bitter. He's yeah. So bitter. He's so bitter. The horse is not going to make rising stars. You want to make the horse a rising star just to piss him <laughs> just off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I can stop yeah. bitching. Right. The fastest two furlongs in the history of parks <laughs> racing. The only two furlongs in the history of parks racing. Yeah, it's interesting. I bet. I wonder what the stats are for the. Cut back yeah, from right. four and a half, yeah, four right. and a half to two far. Right. Yeah. Really What's the ROI on that trainer? <laughs> that's a money angle right there. <laughs>
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. You can learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we don't have a Green Group Guest of the Week this week because everybody is the Green Group Guest of the Week. And shout out to Len Green, John's dad, and, and uh, the founder of The Green Group, being so generous with all the tax consultations, everything. He's always been a big supporter of the show and a big fan of the show. So we always we always love and, and appreciate Len's support. So I hope he doesn't. I hope these tax consultations don't put you out of business because we got three three guys today, and then maybe me at some point. I mean, I mean the tax consultation. Um, but yeah, so shout out to Len and shout out to all the Green Group Guests of the Week for stopping by. And we'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. TDN Writer's Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week is Messier. He went five furlongs and 59 and four Saturday at Santa Anita. Gonna be ridden by John Velasquez in the Kentucky Derby. Maybe a little bit of a forgotten horse on the board. Might get a little bit of a price that you wouldn't have gotten a month ago. But you can check out his work and all of the Kentucky Derby contenders works at XBTV.com. Just search the horse's name. It's almost certainly there. So now we're gonna bring in our last guest, Mike Stidham, a little late addition to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's great Delighted. to have you. We've, had you. we've talked to you on the show before, but it's great to meet you in person. Um, I want to ask about the big horse, Mystic Guide, because he was one of my favorite horses in the handicap division last year. Obviously, he had that incredible run in the Dubai World Cup. Um, he just came back recently to the work tab, I believe. I saw him work this weekend at Keeneland. How's he doing? How you feeling? What kind of campaign are you thinking for with, with for him? Right now, um, he's had two works here at Keeneland. Um, both works were just in hand and, and not really being asked to do a whole lot, but he made it through both works well. Um, we've kept him here at Keeneland because Dr. Bramlage has kind of been watching his progress. Um, we've been pleased with, you know, the way he's come out of both works. And, you know, what we're hoping for is we're, we're looking to, uh, you know, start a campaign maybe at Belmont, uh, looking at maybe the Suburban, Whitney, Jockey Club, Gold Cup are the races that we would be focusing on that would hope, hopefully bring us back here to Keeneland for the Breeders' Cup. For sure. Yeah. Mike, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, you have the kind of operation where you uh, can run in any one of maybe half a dozen tracks uh, around uh, you know, the eastern part of the U.S., uh, et cetera. But it's, to me, it's interesting. You're here at Keeneland. And how much are you looking at this purse structure in Kentucky now? Where I mean, there was an allowance race the other day. went for $130,000 here at Keeneland. So for you, how much of the purses are, are um, weighing, uh, do you weigh when you make your decisions where you're going to put your horses? Well, without a doubt, the purse structure is important, but we've also, we also have a circuit that we've traveled well on. Um, we have a barn at Fairhill owned by one of our clients, David Ross, and uh, it's a beautiful setup at Fairhill. I don't know if you've been there, but mm -hmm. they have a tapita track, a dirt track, they have grass gallops. So we've really worked well out of Fairhill ever since Arlington um, uh demise mm -hmm. and um it's worked for us so that's more what we try to do um that works for us rather than just go after you know the big purses mm -hmm. so that that's that's our program okay. yeah right. and and mike when when you're over in dubai and you're getting a horse ready for for that race um is there something different or special that you're doing to get the horse you know acclimated to the to the new you know region and the new racetrack and things like that like walk walk our audience through 
what you did to prepare Mystic Guide for a big race like that? Well, other than there being 12 million reasons um, <laughs> to be there, um, no, it was, it was an amazing journey. Um, Hillary, my assistant, and I had never been over there. And um, it, it's, it's like no other uh, trip. Um, you get treated like royalty. You know, the horses get treated amazingly. Um, we were, you know, treated re really well. So anyway, it, it is a, a different structure than what we have over here for, from a training standpoint. Uh, the walk to the barn is almost a two mile walk for the horses. So it's almost an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes from the time they leave the barn till they get gallop, get back to the barn. So that's different for them. Luckily, uh, Mystic Guide seemed to flourish from it. He, he loved the routine. He, um, I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be really taxing on him and it's gonna take something out and he might get out of the feed tub. But more than anything, he just seemed to blossom over there and do well at the right time. Um, and like I say, the other uh, difference is going over for the race, you leave the barn about two hours before the race because you have to be vanned from the barn to the uh, staging area where they have these different uh, places to go. He was pre-race pre tested before the race. Then he had to go to another area and we would put the bridle and all that equipment on. And I, I must say, uh, I was concerned back there because he was getting pissed off. Yeah. yeah, he was hot. He didn't like being stuck in the stall while they tested him. I had to ask them to, you know, let him come out a little sooner than they expected. So there was there was a lot of things going on that that concerned me. Then we get to the saddling uh, area and um, going on to the track, a loose horse. Now we got a postponement and Mystic Guide is over there slamming himself against the pony and getting hot. Then we get to the gate, a horse goes under, under the, the gate, gate yeah. and now we got another postponement and they're sticking uh, microphones in my face saying, what are you thinking? And I'm thinking, this is a disaster. Right. You know, how is he gonna overcome this? And um, somehow it worked and it was, it was amazing, so. It, it was a lot, but, um, you know, the horse was able to overcome it. I wanted to ask you a sale question because we've got the Horses of Racing Age sale coming up here at Keelan on Friday. And, you know, th there is a little bit more of an advent of the Horses of Racing Age, the hybrid sales, the digital sales. I feel like the sales environment and the, and the, uh, the schedule is evolving a little bit. You train a lot of homebreds, but you're no stranger to the sales, too. What's your feeling of, about that? Do you think clients are, are, are they down for that or do they prefer a more traditional sale experience? Well, I think personally, I think uh, the COVID experience, you know, pushed us into this. Mm -hmm. And um, people were a little, I think people were reluctant in the beginning because they were like, uh, you know, what is this? This uh, all online stuff. But I think everybody's getting very comfortable with it. I think it's a plus and I think it's gonna help the sales industry a lot. I really do. And I, uh, you know, we've actually had a few in these sales and it's worked well for us, so. Cool. Mike, you had an interesting uh, winner over the weekend. Penny Baker won the Heavenly Cause Stakes at Laurel first time over in the U.S. Looks like a nice prospect. What can you tell us about this horse? She, that's a filly that came to me. I didn't even know she was coming. Um, uh, Michael Banahan called, and uh, who is the racing manager now uh, for Godolphin, and said, we've got a filly that is one or last four on synthetic tracks over there. She's got a dirt pedigree, and um, we're going to bring her over here and want you to work her on the dirt and see what you think. We worked her on the dirt and from the first work on the dirt, it was like she was under a stranglehold, put her behind horses, she took dirt in her face, worked her out of the gate, she worked great. So we were pretty confident going into the race, um, you know, going right into a stake race on a surface she had never run on was concerning, but uh, you could see from the minute she broke out of the gate, she put herself in position, the rider didn't, all he, all he had to do was steer her, and um, he had not, he had a ton of horse turning for home. So we're excited about her, and I think based on the way she won and the number she ran, I think uh, you know graded stakes company is in her future for right. sure.
Great. And, and Mike, my last question is, you know, one of the things that, that's on the horizon right now, 10 weeks away, is the, the Heiser rules being implemented. What does it mean to you? And, and is it enough? Well, I, I think it's much needed. I think we need uh, a central voice to guide us on a lot of different areas, medication, even the uh, situation on uh, the shoeing where we're all going to have to, you know, use the same uh, queen's plate type of shoe. Uh, my blacksmith made a, a good comment. He says, I can uh, get rid of my, my weather app and my grinder now. I, I never have to worry about that again right. because yep. we're all going to have to use the same shoe. So those kind of things are important. I mean, I think we need someone to, you know, say this is what we're going to do and we're all going to do it the same way and we all get on a level playing field. Yep. It's, yep. it's important for the industry. Uniformity, for Absolutely. sure, something sorely needed. Well, Mike, thank you so much for stopping by. It's great to talk to you, great to meet you, and learn that you're a Jersey guy, too, so you're automatically good with us here at this show. So thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you Mike. Thanks for having me. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at West Point TV. Dot com and just right here, West Point had a really impressive winner on Sunday. B Doc, who was an it was an expensive son of Gormley, one off by eleven plus lengths for Doug O'Neill. So congratulations to the partners. Looks like you got a promising three year old there. And also last week, West Point was super busy at the OPS April sale, including purchasing the third highest lot of the entire sale, the one point seven million dollars son of Tappet. So always some exciting things on the horizon for West Point. And we'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse, every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. 2021 was a tremendous year for Legacy Bloodstock. Stock 90% of the hips they offered at Keen on September sold. It's a remarkable clearance rate and just a touch below that, 88% at Keen in November. And Legacy grads have already earned over 2.3% million dollars this year so shout out to tommy and wendy a small outfit that's really competing with the big boys i would say on a, on a daily basis on a weekly basis so check them out yearling sales season is right around the corner So I guess that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, live from Keeneland. Well, not live. Patty keeps telling me not to say live. On scene at Keeneland. I had a great time. I had a, had a good old time with you guys, with the whole crew. How, how's it been for you? I mean, this, this is like going to fantasy camp. Um, you know, between the racing and the sales coming up and uh, the beautiful weather, the really nice people, uh, the ambiance. I mean, I, I would think that, Bill, this is like Fenway Park for you, right? Coming to, coming to Keeneland. Yeah, no, that's it. Well, first of all, the beautiful weather. What are you talking about? I'm freezing, John. But I mean, that's an interesting comparison. You know, old, historic, um, majestic, uh, you know, classy type place. Um, you the know, institution. And it, exactly. That's right. a good way of putting an institution. So uh, never a bad day. And no life. Yankee fans here either, which that's is the other nice goodness. thing for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go Yankees. <laughs> I'll start a chat. No, but it's been so much fun. We want to thank everybody at Keeneland for, for putting us up in this beautiful setting. Couldn't ask for anything more. Had such a great time. I'll definitely be back. The, the only regret I have from this trip is that I didn't stay long enough. So I'll definitely be back in the fall. So Thank you to everybody for watching. Thanks to Bill. Thanks to Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guests of the week, Chance Tim, Mike Stidham, and Tony Lacey. Our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Leah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson, who's right here. Appreciate you guys coming out. So 
We'll see you next week. Back on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs>